forgiven me. And thank you for the love that you give me. And help me to give my love and blessings to my family and friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming up. this time, I turn it over to you, Bishop. <clears throat> Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. It is a joy and delight to be with you on this gorgeous morning. Thank you, dear Pastor Randy Winson, for inviting us along with the congregation. Our vision statement as the Northwestern Ohio Synod is marked with the cross of Christ forever. Think of the hymn we just sang, sealed with that cross, marked on the brow with the seal of him who died for us. Marked with the cross of Christ for us forever in our baptism, we who belong to the congregations like Zion, the ministries, think of our camp ministries at Camp Moana or Luther Memorial Camp or Luther Camp, our prison ministries at Blair Smith and Marion Correctional Facility, our campus ministry at UT, hospital ministries, Congregations, ministries, agencies, Lutheran Social Service, Lutheran Home Society, Filling Home, Luther Home of Mercy, Osterlin, Wernley. We are signs of and participants in God's inbreaking reign in Christ Jesus. So our prayer is that when people see us individually as those marked with the cross of Christ, or when they see our congregations in action, or the ministries of this synod, they'll see something of what God is up to as we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And so being here gives me the opportunity to thank God for all that happens because we are the body of Christ together in this synod and in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Just a couple of things I can think of just offhand. The wonderful youth gathering where we had the privilege of joining with uh, roughly 700 from northwestern Ohio and 30,000 of our best friends from around the United States. Uh, so many youth uh, talked about what a significant experience that was for them. Similarly, people in Detroit said they can't believe all that these young people are doing for the city of Detroit. An incredible event that shapes people's lives and reminds us of what it means the body, to be the body of Christ together. You gather, you're taking uh, uh, the noisy offering for the World Hunger Appeal. Uh, the World Hunger Appeal supports um, uh, ministries throughout the world uh, thinking of wells in Africa uh, helps with disaster relief. Um, I think of the ministries that are happening right now through Lutheran immigration um, and refugee services by virtue of all the immigrants who are fleeing war-torn countries. We're present as the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America through your support. I think of um, being at Camp Moana yesterday, so many of our children experience the joy of God's creation and hear the story of this God who is creator of all things, who takes on flesh in our Lord Jesus Christ. Many who are called to be pastors and leaders in the church will talk about how these camps shape their life, including my own children. I think of the, the ministries that we are doing in terms of preparing new leaders for the church. I mentioned to Pastor Randy that in a few weeks I'll be visiting his alma mater, Luther Seminary, uh, making my last seminary visit as a bishop and have the privilege of preaching for Reformation. Uh, we have pastors like your pastor because we are the church together and work at nurturing and supporting them. And within the synod, we have the Fund for Leaders that helps to provide scholarships for those preparing for leadership. I think of uh, the work of Lutheran World Relief that happens because Lutheran Christians are working together. Uh, a bunch of years ago, I had the privilege of participating in a steady trip to West Africa, Niger, Burkina Faso, Togo, 
some of the toughest places in the world and was present as quilts were distributed and soap uh, and other bags that bring relief. That was pretty incredible uh, to think of, again, what it means to be the church, to be the body of Christ together. In our work uh, within the Synod, we have roughly 25 congregations at any one time and call processes, and our being together helps us to work with congregations in times of transition. So all of those things uh, are examples of how we are a church together. So I want to thank you for your prayers, for our life together, for your support, your mission support uh, that enables us to do this ministry together, uh, and, and in many cases for your own personal involvement and for your ministry in this town and community. Again, Pastor Winston mentioned to me last week about your collaborative uh, effort of being God's hands in this community in terms of the work projects that you did. What a wonderful, wonderful example. I could go on, but I want to get to this text today. Our theme for this year within the Synod is because God is a God who brings life out of death. In Jesus' death and resurrection, we who pray for the incoming reign of God in Christ Jesus can always expect to be surprised. And so when the pastor asked for my sermon title, I said, that's not hard. Surprised again, colon, the call to service. Expect to be surprised. On the front page of Toledo's, the, the Toledo Blade this morning was that article which says, Pope Francis is coming, expect to be surprised. I thought, ah, they must have learned about our sermon, uh, sermon uh, our synod theme. Expect to be surprised because here's a pope who reminds the church that it's called to be a church that reflects mercy. Here's a pope who reminds us that our vocation is a call to be among those who are poor and who are the outcasts. Here is a pope who says that part of what the church is about is the work of forgiveness. He has a way of making people nervous, including political leaders, including church leaders, as he continues to point to the God who is active in Jesus Christ. The problem is we aren't always welcoming of the surprises God may have in store in our Lord Jesus. As we read the Gospel of Mark, as the story unfolds, there is the surprise of Jesus asking John to be baptized. In the Gospels, it talks about how John protests, saying, Jesus, why are you being baptized? I'm the one who needs forgiveness, not you. Or the surprise where we discover that this one who is the Son of God is driven out into the wilderness to be tempted. Later on, the writer to the Hebrews will say, tempted in every respect, just like we are only without sin. This is the one who, when the demons recognize him, when nobody else does, he casts out the demons, and people are surprised, amazed. Or, when a paralytic is dropped through the roof by friends because they want to get him to Jesus for healing, the first word that Jesus says is, your sins are forgiven. And people are surprised, including the religious leaders. What gives you the right, you man from Nazareth, to forgive sins? Only God can do that. And then Jesus surprises by saying to the paralytic, you want to see the authority at work? Which is harder, to forgive sins or to say, get up off your bed and walk? The hardest thing is to forgive, but Jesus now says, get off your bed and walk. Or Jesus surprises when the disciples are in that boat and there's a great storm and they're terrified. And then Jesus says in the face of that storm, peace be still. And they're surprised and amazed. And then comes that lesson we heard last Sunday, at least many of our congregations heard that, where Jesus says to his disciples, ask them, who do people say that I am? And their response is, Peter's response is, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
And then Jesus goes on to say, yes, and it's necessary for the Son of Man to be, be, be betrayed, to suffer, and to die, and the third day rise again, and Peter and the disciples are surprised. That's not what they bargained for. And Peter says, this will never happen to you. And Jesus says to him, get behind me, Satan. And then the surprise of today's scripture lesson. Once again, Jesus talks with them. He's going incognito, going throughout Capernaum, and he's teaching them, and the text says he's teaching them that the Son of Man must suffer, be betrayed, be crucified, and raised again. And this time the text says they are so surprised. This isn't what they bargained for. That might say something about their vocation as well. And they don't ask him anything. The text says because they are afraid. And so what do you do when you are afraid? Well, you look out for your own interests. And so the disciples pass on what Jesus says and begin to argue among themselves who will be the greatest in this kingdom of God. Does that sound familiar? We think of our unfolding political presidential campaign and we know that those who become the advisors of the various candidates do that partly because they know if their candidate is elected, some of them will be given positions of authority and power and prestige. Motos probably mixed like most of, us are, most of ours are. And so that's what Jesus' disciples were counting on, that they would get those positions of honor and respect and glory. What are you talking about, Jesus says? The greatest? Who's going to be the greatest? And then Jesus turns the table. He surprises them by saying, whoever would be great among you, let that one become servant of all. Wow. Called to be a servant. Do we bargain for that? Isn't that the exact thing that we try to avoid? Think of those vocations that are our service vocations. How often we think of those who are in the fields or cleaning our rooms or waiting upon us as those who are on the lower end of society. And Jesus says, if your biggest interest is being great, well, I invite you to become servant of all. Elsewhere, Jesus will say, for the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. I don't know about you, but like the disciples, I prefer to talk about greatness. How we can have authority and power over other people, how we can be respected and viewed and given positions of honor. That's what I want. That's what I like. Instead, Jesus says, how are you at cleaning tables? How are you at welcoming the poor? How are you at forgiving sinners? The risk is if we don't hear what Jesus is saying, we risk this one, missing out on this one who has become our servant. Remember the story in the Gospel of John where on that night before Jesus is betrayed, he takes a bowl and a basin of water and a towel and he says to the disciples, I'm going to wash your feet. Remember Peter, what Peter says? Sorry, Jesus, not me. That you would be my servant. And then Jesus' response is, Oh, Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Unless you can acknowledge your need, you miss out. You're left on your own. And that's not a good place to be. And Peter says, oh, Jesus, in that case, give me a bath. And Jesus says, your feet are enough. The incredible story is this one who does become servant of all. Who will allow himself to be betrayed? 
by his own, who promised they would never bail out on him. But when the chips are down, their interest is in saving their own life. Not unlike my interest and maybe yours. But this is the one who will be stretched out on the cross. This is the one who will be the most demeaned, mocked. If you really are the Messiah, come down from the cross. They laughed. Even as Jesus would cry out the psalm, Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, servant even to death? Later on, Paul will say, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who did not think equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, humbling himself even to death, yes, death on a cross. But this is the one whom God has lifted up. Lift high the cross, we sang. And this is the one who still serves us. If we are willing to let him serve us, we are in bondage. We cannot free ourselves. And this one serves us. As we hear the pastor saying, in the name of Christ, I forgive you your sins. This one serves us as we are washed like Peter and the other disciples, joined to Jesus' death and resurrection so that we don't have to be afraid of dying or preserving our lives and are free to take our lives and offer them for the sake of others. And when we have the deepest of all hunger, we hold out our hands in order to receive the body of Christ given for you and to have that little sip of wine and hear the words as this one serves you again, the blood of Christ poured out for you. And within this community, we discover we are not alone, but we are with brothers and sisters in Christ who pray for us, who care about us, who tend to us. And we get to see that in the name of Christ. So Jesus will take a little child in his arms and say, whoever receives this child, receives not just this child, but receives me, Jesus. And whoever receives me receives the one who sent me, namely God Almighty. So who do you think of in your life who's modeled servanthood for you? I was talking about this text last evening with my wife Heidi, and I said I can't hear this text without thinking about a time when I was in seminary and living with Franciscans, those who are preparing to become Franciscan monks or priests at St. Bonaventure Friary in St. Louis. I lived with them for five months along with a number of other Lutheran seminarians. And this really was kind of a great place because we were provided for by some Croatian sisters who had fled the communist era back in those days and who provided our food and guess what? Who also did our laundry. That was kind of a big deal. At any rate, one day one of these sisters comes up to me, and normally they were always in the background. She comes up to me and says, I am so sorry. And I said, why? She says, I couldn't get that ink spot out of your T-shirt. That ink spot, you know, those leaky, leaky pens, had been in my T-shirt for years. And she comes to me and apologizes for not getting that ink spot out. I can't imagine how much courage it took for her to come and try to speak some broken English. And I said, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do for us. And she said, it is my honor. I am simply a humble servant doing that which is my duty. I thought about that often. This woman who empties herself and doesn't begrudge the giving. Before worship, I stuck my head with the children and saw the children making hands. And uh, the teacher pointed out that Austin is one who does a lot of wonderful things. But Austin wasn't able to recount them as the children were making hands. And I thought, isn't that exactly the nature of what it means to be those who so much know what it means to be cared for by Christ that we aren't even paying attention we can't even name those opportunities when we have served the other because we're called to do it. In Austin's response, 
I see something of the inbreaking reign of God in Christ Jesus. Well, what about you? Surprised again? Called to serve? Ah, indeed. But the one who calls us is the one who frees us, who gives us forgiveness, who gives us the promise of life, who gave himself for all, who frees us to take our eyes off ourselves and open ourselves to the other. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day, Here I Am, Lord, found on page 574 of the ELW.